This is CGTN, China Global Television Network. Libya's unity government takes over in a smooth transition of power. European Medicines Agency says AstraZeneca vaccine benefits far outweigh the risk, even as nations await investigation. And a look at the challenges facing African nations, even as they begin rolling out the coronavirus vaccines. Hello, welcome to Africa Live. As always, great to have you with us. I'm Richard Ntal, live in Nairobi. And for those of you joining us from across the continent and around the globe, we thank you for joining us. And tonight, I'm alongside my colleague Uche, who has our business headlines. Uche. Thank you, Richard. And here's a look at what's coming up on Africa Live Biz. South Sudan begins refining oil in the northern part of the nation. And Uganda unveils its first locally manufactured diesel-powered bus. Of course, all that coming up within the program. For now, back to you, Richard. Thank you so much, Uche. Once again, welcome to Africa Live. So good to have you with us. Let's begin in Libya, where a new unity government has officially taken office. The new team takes over from the two warring administrations in the eastern and western regions, thus completing a smooth transition of power after a decade of violent chaos. Members of the new cabinet were sworn in on Monday. Fayez al Siraj, who led the outgoing government of National Court in Tripoli, embraced his successor, Prime Minister Abdul Hamid Debebe, after handing over power. Now, Debebe's government emerged from talks involving the United Nations and was endorsed by Parliament last week. It is mandated to improve services, unify state institutions, and oversee national elections at the end of the year. Regarding the president and the members of the presidential council, we are here on the first day and we took it upon ourselves, God willing, that we, former government of national accord, will not hold on to power. We will move forward with Libya to solve its conflicts and problems. But unfortunately, a reality was imposed upon us, a bitter one, that Libyans have all lived through the war. But once the dialogue led to the emergence of the government of national unity, we were adamant from the beginning that we will transfer power immediately after the House of Representatives gave its approval. We hope they will succeed in all their duties. The top diplomats and defense chiefs of Japan and the United States have held talks in Tokyo. The meeting comes ahead of high-level talks between Chinese and U.S. officials in Alaska on March the 18th. Xing Ruinan has more. Meeting close partners in Asia and reaffirming commitment to traditional allies. Uh, we will continue to work together on core security issues like the denuclearization of North Korea and maritime security. Uh, and we'll stand up for our shared democratic values because we know that democracy and human rights are core elements of any stable and secure region. The alliance is seen by some in Asia as a potential counterweight to a growing Chinese influence and alleged aggression in Asia Pacific. The security environment is becoming increasingly severe, so it is necessary for us to make the Japan-US alliance even stronger. China says cooperation between Japan and the U.S. should benefit the entire region. We believe that exchanges and cooperation between the United States and Japan should help enhance mutual understanding and trust, as well as unity and cooperation among countries in the region. It should contribute to the peace and stability in the Asia-Pacific region, instead of targeting and damaging the interests of a third party. Last week, China once again rejected allegations that it follows expansionist policies in the region and called for dialogue with Japan over maritime disputes. We hope that Japan will honor the spirit of its four-point principled agreement with China, work together with China and stop words and deeds that may lead to a more complicated situation. 
On Thursday, the U.S. delegation will meet with senior Chinese officials Yang Jiechi, director of the Office of the Central Commission for Foreign Affairs, and Wang Yi, the foreign minister and state councillor. They're expected to discuss a range of issues, including trade and other issues of disagreement. Xin Reinan, CGTN. The European Medicines Agency maintains that it is convinced that the benefits of the AstraZeneca COVID-19 vaccine outweigh the risk of side effects. Now, this comes after a dozen European countries suspended the use of the jab. The countries include Germany, France, Italy and Portugal. They did so over reports over serious blood clotting events shortly after people took the AstraZeneca vaccine. The executive director of the Safety Committee, Emmer Cook, said experts were currently reviewing the alleged side effects and will deliver their conclusions on Thursday. The World Health Organization has also urged countries to continue with the jabs as investigations into the claims take place. And Ghana plans to introduce a COVID-19 tax to finance its health sector. It comes after the country's economy has been badly hit by the pandemic. While the proposed tax has yet to be proposed by lawmakers, it is already facing criticism from many Ghanaians. CGTN's Nabil Ahmed Rofai reports from Accra. Ghana's economy is trying to recover from the disruptions caused by COVID-19. The government has proposed new taxes in this year's budget to show up revenue. It includes a COVID-19 health levy of 1% on value-added tax and a 1% on national health insurance levy. But Ghanaians are divided on the introduction of new taxes. I don't think it's a good thing for me because we don't know what they are using the money for. The, some part of people are just keeping the money for their pocket. So I don't see the use of me to go and pay the fund or do anything about that. We can't continue to borrow to fund our development, so I'm OK with the new taxes. I don't support the introduction of the COVID-19 health levy because I don't believe the government will use the money for its intended purpose. The government says it had to raise more than $4 billion through external loans to deal with the shocks caused by the pandemic. It now hopes to raise about $900 million from new taxes to finance its projects. We should look at it holistically in the sense that while some sectors and some individuals or some activities in the economy are going to pay uh, some new taxes and they, those sectors are going to have the impact of that and they are possibly going to transfer to the final consumer. We also have some of the final consumers, particularly in the informal sector, whose uh, quarterly payments of stamp duties are suspended, also going to benefit. Still, economists say the introduction of new taxes is not sustainable. They want the government to also tackle the shortfalls in revenue generation in the country. We have situations where uh, the appropriate taxes um, probably are not pay, and those that are making the effort to pay, we know, and there is not is a public knowledge that some of the amount paid don't get to the appropriate government coffers, and so this is a typical example where if you are dealing with the revenue, why well, there should be effort to open the, ta uh, the, the, the 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 base of the tax paying uh, populace. We should also deal with any leakages. The government plans to use revenue from the COVID-19 health levy to fund the distribution of COVID-19 vaccines across the country and also build hospitals. While the proposed introduction of COVID-19 health tax is being kicked against by some Ghanaians, lawmakers will now begin a debate on the 2021 budget. Within the next three weeks, it will become clear whether they will approve the new taxes or not. Nabil Ahmed Rufai, CGTN, Accra, Ghana. A year into the battle against COVID-19, the African continent has smashed through a grim barrier. Four million cases have been registered in the region and close to 40,000 new infections reported in the last week alone. Over 100,000 people have died from the virus and that has wreaked havoc with livelihoods and health systems around the world. CGTN's Julie Shire reports. Africa's first COVID-19 case was reported in Egypt February last year. The caseload has since climbed to over 4 million and the continent continues to count its dead. We don't have a good 
idea really of the true burden of disease in, in many African countries. And, and it's going to be many years until we really understand the impact of the epidemic in, in many uh, countries. We've seen a lot of innovation, we've seen a lot of uh, impressive programs, and we've seen that um, what's been learned from other epidemics, such as Ebola, has, has been applied uh, to, to this epidemic. The continent is slowly emerging from a second wave sparked by the N501YV2 variant, which first appeared in South Africa. The rapid spread caught countries off guard and placed under-resourced health facilities under immense strain. We really need to understand how important it is for, for everyone still to, to contribute to, to slowing the spread of the virus. As we go into these periods of kind of lower level transmission, people get reassured, but, but this virus is still dangerous and it's still spreading in the population. South Africa has helped ramp up testing and monitoring capabilities to detect new variants and possible resurgence of the virus. When you have uncontrolled spread of the virus, coupled with some kind of seroprevalence from a previous wave, you are creating an environment where immune escape is going to be selected for. As soon as you identify, hang on, there's, there's another variant with even further mutations, you can contain it. If you're not checking what's going on in terms of this virus, then by the time it's already spread, it's too late. The arrival of 14.6 million vaccine doses, although slow, has helped boost the continent's response and are mainly being administered to frontline healthcare workers. We should be aiming for 100% so that it's clear to people that, that we want everyone to take up the vaccine at least we've got some of the healthcare workers protected and, and that will help us to deal with the challenge of, of a resurgence. We all want to move quickly now and transition to, to getting the vaccines into um, other members of the population that, that are at high risk of, of severe disease. The African continent is not in this battle alone. Countries such as Brazil, the UK, the US are also struggling to get a grip on new mutations. But scientists have warned Africa to keep up its guard as fatigue sets in and more movement is allowed around the continent. Judy Shire, CGTN, Johannesburg, South Africa. The Democratic Republic of Congo has spent considerable time and effort countering rumors and misinformation about COVID-19 vaccines since last year. But a few weeks after receiving doses of the AstraZeneca vaccine, the country postponed its vaccination campaign over blood clot fears reported in Europe. And as CGTN's Chris Ojamringa reports, the postponement has been welcomed by the many Congolese citizens. Health workers educate locals in the DRC's eastern town of Beni about the importance of Ebola vaccines. Misinformation about the vaccines and the mistrust of workers were some of the biggest challenges they faced during an Ebola outbreak in 2018. The officials had to work closely with leaders in the host communities to dispel the misinformation and they are now using the same strategy to counter rumors about COVID-19 vaccines. We are working with community leaders, village chiefs and opinion leaders to spread the word about the safety and efficacy of COVID-19 vaccines. That's the same strategy we used during the Ebola outbreak in 2018. It worked back then and we believe it will work this time round. The government received 1.7 million doses of the AstraZeneca vaccine earlier this month under the COVAX program. The arrival of the vaccine sparked optimism among health officials about curbing the spread of COVID-19. According to the study that we are conducting, people are becoming more and more receptive about this vaccine. But the government postponed its vaccination campaign last week following reports about blood clots by people who were vaccinated in several European countries. And that has increased vaccine skepticism across the capital, Kinshasa. 
The Minister of Health said they'll carry out more investigations about the AstraZeneca vaccine in order to protect us from negative side effects that clearly shows that the vaccines are unsafe. God didn't approve the use of the vaccines in our country. That's why he allowed that confusion about the blood clots to happen. Many of us would have died if the vaccines were administered. Health experts from the World Health Organization, however, say the AstraZeneca vaccine is safe and have dismissed any link between the jab and the formation of blood clots. The DRC Health Ministry says a new date for the country's vaccination campaign will be announced after health experts release results of national and international investigations about the AstraZeneca vaccine. Chris Sachamringa, CGTN, Kinshasa, Democratic Republic of Congo. Zimbabwe has received a second batch of COVID-19 vaccinations from China. President Emerson Nangawa received the consignment at the Robert Mugabe International Airport on Tuesday morning. TGTN's Farai Mwakatuya reports from Harare. One month after receiving its first consignment of COVID-19 vaccines, Zimbabwe took delivery of donated Sinopharm doses and its first batch of purchased Sinovac vials. The two consignments which are now, Your Excellency, totaling the 400,000 doses, have made a great change in terms of health to our people. We now have two vaccines. The Sinopharm, the Sinopharm which is the, the donated vaccine from the People's Republic of China, and the Sinovac, of which we will be procuring two uh, million doses. Zimbabwe is the first African country to receive a second donation of vaccines from China. That's because China and Zimbabwe enjoy the time on their friendship, and Zimbabwe need the vaccine support. And uh, China and Zimbabwe always support each other. Zimbabwe's leader hailed China for ensuring equitable access to vaccines. The People's Republic of China's unparalleled readiness to avail access to the vaccines for commercial procurement testifies to our shared and mutual desire to continue enhancing cooperation, particularly in these times of distress and competition for resources. The Zimbabwean government says it has set aside 100 million U.S. dollars to procure enough vaccines to inoculate 60 percent of its population. The arrival of these doses will enable Zimbabwe to expand its vaccination drive beyond just frontline workers to include most notably school teachers. The 2020 academic calendar, which had been on hold for two months, began on March 15th for exam students. All other learners will return to class on March 22nd as the country continues easing restrictions after a reduction in new infections that had spiked during the festive season. Farai Mwakutuya, CGTN, Harare, Zimbabwe. Time now for a short break, but the news continues on Africa Live. Here's a look at what's ahead. Ethiopia's government says it is delivering daily critical aid to almost all the six million people in Tigray. And the Nigerian parliament wants President Buhari to hire foreign mercenaries to tackle Boko Haram. Africa is a continent of diversity with varied climates and enchanting geography, and a people so distinct, but with a shared enduring spirit. We are at the heart of the continent to bring you the untold stories. Let's have a look. We celebrate Africa as it shapes its own destiny. 
Tunis. 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 Africa Live. Find your voice. Welcome back to Africa Live, everyone. Thanks for staying with us. The Ethiopian government has just announced that 4.2 million people in the war-ravaged Tigray region have received food and related humanitarian aid. According to the Ministry of Foreign Affairs, almost all of the 6 million people in the Tigray uh, need support daily. The ministry said food rations are being delivered to rural areas and most towns. Here is uh, CGTN's Gerun Chala with more on that story. After what the government called a law enforcement mission was concluded about two months back, the humanitarian situation in Tigray remained to be worrying for many. Now, Ethiopia says about 4.2 million of its citizens in the north are being provided with food and related aid. Food and food related aid has been delivered to 4.2 million citizens in Tigray. We announced that the first round of that work is completed and we are now staging a feasibility study to soon begin the second round. To avoid any suffering of our citizens, we, as much as we can, are working to keep this relief service going and to keep the momentum too. The Ministry of Foreign Affairs further said Ethiopia has already opened the much-requested humanitarian corridors in the region, but said the global community's contribution so far is only 30%. 70% of humanitarian services are being provided by Ethiopia itself. Still, Ethiopia is facing pressure from the U.S. and the European Union. They said there are human rights abuses. They claimed women are being raped and people are being murdered and looted. We said, well, come and let us independently verify what you are saying. We told them we are willing to support that process. They said the humanitarian service must be strengthened. And we agreed with that. It is us providing 70% of the aid. So we have met all their conditions. After this, whatever they talk about slamming sanctions and whatnots, it is simply an empty song for us. On the other hand, uh, unverified reports suggest TPLA force stage small attacks here and there. Their leadership even sometimes claims the capture of small towns. Ethiopian authorities, however, say TPLF is no force to worry about. The focus now is on the rehabilitation and reconstruction of Tigray. Group Talasirian, Addis Ababa, Ethiopia. Let's turn our attention to Nigeria, where three teachers are still missing after being kidnapped by gunmen in Kaduna State in the northwest of Nigeria. The attack on Rima, uh, Rima Primary School was the first on an elementary school in a wave of such attacks in which more than 700 people have been abducted since December. Officials had initially indicated children had also been kidnapped, but this was later revised after they were all accounted for. 39 students remain missing from an earlier attack on a forestry college. The latest kidnapping marks the fifth mass school abduction since December. Now, here's an update from our correspondent in Abuja, Philly Haza, on the unfolding situation in Nigeria. Uh, although the government uh, uh, initially said some children were kidnapped, it has confirmed that, uh, you know, two children have been found and that only teachers, three teachers actually, uh, from the school in Beningwari, local government uh, area, primary school, uh, are at the moment missing or at, uh, in the hands of the kidnappers. And uh, the, uh, uh, the security operative, that's the person in charge of the internal security and home affairs, Samuel Ruan, in Kaduna State, says that uh, uh, personnel, the security personnel, are actually in hot pursuit of these um, bandits, as they call them, or kidnappers, so that they can uh, find and rescue these teachers. The attack occurred on Monday at the school but you realize that uh, uh, Mr. Samuel also says that there's been some kind of security measures put in place in several schools that's the ones that are still in operation uh, to deter these criminals and because of those security measures these um, this latest attack would have actually been worse so uh, that's the reason the security operators were able to quickly uh, get to the scene to reduce the number of people kidnapped. Well, um, at the moment, there's no word uh, as to the whereabouts of the previous 
uh, people kidnapped, 39 people kidnapped last week uh, from the school in Kaduna State, the forestry school. Uh, but the government says that um, the security operatives are still in search of these people and that, um, that more security personnel have been deployed. Uh, surveillance uh, aircraft, uh, rather helicopters, are also in search in different forests. You know, because in Nigeria, you have many of these states, especially in the northern part with ungoverned areas, quite a number of ungoverned areas, especially forest. Uh, and so these um, kidnappers are taking advantage of those spaces to perpetrate their crimes. And so the government is doing its best, according to uh, the, the security operatives in Kaduna State, to see how that they can comb these forests, these um, areas where they suspect that the kidnappers are. Well, Nigeria's President Mohamed Buhari is facing growing calls to hire foreign mercenaries to combat Boko Haram insurgents. For more than 10 years, the Nigerian military has been battling Boko Haram in the northeast of the country. But despite the military's efforts, the war is still far from over. CGTN's Deji Badmus has the details. Lately, Nigeria has seen increased attacks by insurgent group Boko Haram and its splinter Islamic State West African province, or ISWAP. About three weeks ago, Boko Haram fired rocket-propelled grenades into the heavily guarded Borono state capital of Maiduguri, killing at least 10 persons. And just a few days ago, about 15 soldiers were killed in a Boko Haram ambush, one in a series of attacks against the military lately. Worried by the growing number of the attacks, Nigeria's lower chamber of parliament last week passed a resolution calling on the president to hire foreign-paid fighters to take on the insurgents. But the president has pointedly rejected the idea. But the direction of the commander-in-chief is that we do not engage mercenaries when we have um, our own people to deal with this problem. This is basically a, pres a presidential directive. We have the resources. It's just misapplication or underutilization that has affected our ability to deal with these people. In 2014, under former President Goodluck Jonathan, Nigeria engaged a South African private firm to combat insurgents in the Northeast. But soon after he became president, Buhari cancels the contract, insisting the country's military must do the job. We cannot go back and do it because of the morale of our own troops. Because our troops are there, all they need is to be equipped and then boost their morale by giving them their benefits and everything, and they will go and do the best they could. It's one of the best military in Africa. We cannot afford to go and now bring soldiers of fortune, pay them humongous sums of money, while our, what will our troops be doing then? Being a former military general himself, it's difficult to see President Mohamed Buhari accepting to engage foreign paid fighters to combat Boko Haram and ISWAP. He's insisted the country's military will eventually prevail and that the country would get past the current phase of its security challenges. Deji Badmos, CGTN, Lagos, Nigeria. And it's time now for our business segment. Over to you, Uche. Thanks, Richard. And coming up on Africa Life Biz. South Sudan begins refining oil in the northern part of the nation. And Uganda unveiled its first locally manufactured diesel-powered bus. Nature is essential for humans to exist, from pollinating our crops to stabilizing our climate. But our natural world is under serious threat. Humanity's influence on the decline of nature is so great that around one million species already face extinction. One continent, Africa, is trying to halt the trend. There are some special people doing some incredible work on the ground to help conserve the continent's fauna, flora, and cultural heritage whilst introducing these riches to the rest of the world. Africa is the nexus of enterprise, and global business will tell you why it matters. From the mega investment projects to multi-billion dollar mergers and acquisitions. Africa today collects, just in terms of revenues from taxes alone, $545 billion a year. If you take 10% of that, 
and you devote it to the energy sector. Problem solved. All this on Global Business, weekdays at this time on CGTN. Now, with thousands of healthcare workers being vaccinated in South Africa, there is growing optimism that Africa's most developed nation will soon enjoy an economic recovery. Now, the vaccination drive got off to a rocky start with the revelation that the AstraZeneca vaccine was less effective on the COVID variant, which was discovered in the country. With more vaccines set to arrive in the nation, many are hoping for normally normality again. Here's Sumitra Naidu reporting. Many are skeptical that life will go back to normal, or at least the normal we knew. COVID-19 spread across the world like a tsunami, causing widespread devastation. It affected just about all departments of the, the establishment as well as the business. Uh, our guest houses as well as the hotel actually closed down totally. Uh, we were in a quandary because we carried our staff's wages for a couple of months until we just couldn't handle it. South Africa, known for its tourism, was left abandoned. However, the industry is slowly recovering. Domestic tourism has helped, but South Africa has grown its tourism through foreign arrivals. With the precautionary measures that are put into place, they, it's also expensive and it's costly. Uh, but uh, people are also wanting a better deal. And I think just for us to keep our heads above the water and to survive in the industry, we are abiding by some of the requests. And uh, we're trying to market the business in more bigger and better ways, although it's very, very slow. Nearly 150,000 health workers have received their jabs thus far. Vaccinating the rest of the population, around 56 million people, will take time and money. I think there's going to be a lot of unhappiness around people. We saw it with the, with the healthcare workers now in phase 1A. I don't want the vaccines. Once the, when the vaccines started to come in, there were nearly fights to get that vaccine. Some economists have warned that a full economic recovery may take a few years. But with ease, lockdown restrictions, industries have reopened and the economy looks set to improve, albeit at a slower pace. Indeed, it is good. News. On the other hand, I think we've, if you go by, by popular experts' opinion, they tell us that there could be a third and even a fourth wave. So if you look at South Africa at this point in time, the vaccine is being rolled out among the health workers. So it's not necessarily really open to the rest of the public. So what is the implication of this to small businesses? It means that they will have to be very creative and innovative in terms of their approach to get your products to the markets to their customers and which will probably be still limiting a lot of face-to-face -face interactions. The Treasury has budgeted $600 million for the vaccine rollout. Government is procuring the vaccines for all South Africans. The jabs will be given free in the public health care sector while private patients will get it through their medical aids. Time though is not on our side. It will take a while before South Africa can reach herd immunity. Sumitra Nadu, CGTN, Johannesburg, South Africa. Well, let's head to South Sudan now. The country has begun refining petroleum in the northern parts. The government says the production will help speed up electrification of the country as well as stabilize its ailing economy. Here's CGTN's Patrick Oyet reporting. At an oil refinery in Bentiu in Unity State, production is underway. Trucks loaded with fuel refined there are already arriving in Cuba. South Sudan's National Oil Corporation, Nile Petroleum, is managing the refinery. So now we have come to the market. Not uh, to just to get money, but to have at least a support uh, to let that high prices in the market get down. Nile Petroleum says it plans to construct four more refineries across the country. Currently, we are producing 3,000 barrels a day of uh, refined products. Basically, uh, diesel, about 30%, and then heavy fuel oil. They call it furnace. So about 70, 68%. Uh, in the next two, three months, we'll uh, expand. It will be 10,000 barrels a day. 
South Sudan's government says the heavy fuel will be used in generators that supply electricity to the city. It says it plans to build more power stations to increase that supply further. According to the World Bank, South Sudan is one of the most oil-dependent countries in the world. Oil accounts for almost the totality of exports, 90% of revenue and more than one-third of its gross domestic product. However, the country has been relying on fuel imports for the domestic market. The government now says it plans to start exporting refined fuel to South Sudan's neighboring countries. Patrick Koyet, CGTN, Juba, South Sudan. Meanwhile, Uganda has unveiled its first locally manufactured diesel-powered bus. Kira Motors Corporation, a state-owned company, says it is expanding its production capacity to become more competitive. Here's CGTN's Hilary Ayesiga with more on the story. This is Kayola Diesel Coach, a new product from Kira Motors Corporation. Engineers are testing its roadworthiness. We have an electronically controlled air suspension system. Uh, which enables real-time adjustment of the suspension as well as ground clearance to maximize comfort on whatever terrain that the driver might be taking this bus. Kira Motors Corporation unveiled Africa's first electric vehicle in 2011. Five years later, the Ugandan company launched a solar bus named Kayola. And now they are venturing into manufacturing diesel buses something which has attracted criticism from development experts. I think when we started with the electric um, uh, 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 bus, the, 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 the market was not well uh, studied. And um, there are certain aspects that go with it. You must have a, a certain infrastructure um, uh, uh, for this uh, um, innovation uh, to work. Um, the batteries, the charging stations. Kira Motors Corporation says they are waiting for the government to allocate them funds to set up the required infrastructure. But for now, they will be developing both electric and diesel buses so that they can become more competitive in the industry. By the end of this year, we will have uh, rolled out over 1,000 buses uh, on our streets, uh, working with uh, partners locally and internationally and uh, at least 50 of these should be electric. Uganda wants to ban imported buses as a way of boosting her local automotive industry. But environmentalists are concerned that locally made buses that use diesel could pollute the environment. Uganda imports on average 45,000 used vehicles annually, according to the Uganda Revenue Authority. But with the production of made in Uganda vehicles, the government hopes it can tap into the growing demand for cars in the East African market and beyond. Hilara Isga, CGTN, Kampala, Uganda. Well, let's get you some international news now. Top officials from China and the U.S. will meet this week in Anchorage, Alaska, in the United States. CGTN's Nathan King looks ahead to the event. Anchorage very much uh, right in the middle of U.S.-China relations this week, uh, including physically. It's 6,000 kilometers from here to Washington, D.C., 6,000 kilometers from here to Beijing. So a perfect backdrop also for the issues when it comes to issues that could bring the two sides together and have done it in the past. For example, climate change, commerce and also COVID. Uh, speaking of which, we spoke to the former governor of Alaska, Bill Walker, who is hopeful that after a terrible year and several years for US-China relations, that these meetings could at least chart a path forward for the Biden administration and beyond. Governor Walker has uh, hosted President Xi before after his Mar-a-Lago visit in 2017. He stopped over here in Anchorage. Uh, Alaska has 15 memorandums of understanding when it comes to natural gas exports to China. Those haven't developed because of the trade friction. They are ready to go. And in fact, a lot of Alaska's development depends on those contracts when it comes to the uh, energy sector. They've seen an uptick in tourism uh, from China over the years, and they want that to come back as COVID recedes. Uh, recedes. So it's a very important uh, backdrop. 
As for the talks themselves, well, just Thursday, as you know, the Secretary of State from the U.S. is coming back from allies Japan uh, and the Republic of Korea to be joined by the National Security Advisor and, of course, China's top diplomat and Politburo member, Yang Zhechi, and Foreign Minister Wang Yi. The first face-to-face -face talks with the Biden administration. The rhetoric has already turned way down. Now will the policies change as well? Nathan King, CGTN, Anchorage, Alaska. Well, let's move on now. Tesla has added new titles to the chief executive officer and chief finance officer titles. CEO Elon Musk will now be called Techno King of Tesla, while finance chief Zachary Kirkhorn will be referred to as Master of Coin. Now, the electric car maker did not explain the reasons for the cryptic new titles. Musk also shared a new electronic music track about a non-fungible token, or NFT, which is a new type of digital asset that is authenticated by blockchain. Now, the popularity of NFTs has exploded during the pandemic as enthusiasts and investors scramble to spend enormous sums of money on items that only exist online. Meanwhile, Volkswagen is confident of cutting costs and raising profit margins in the coming years from an ambitious electric mobility expansion plan. Now, the world's second largest car maker aims to more than double deliveries of electric vehicles to one million this year. Chief Executive Herbert Diaz, however, told a virtual news conference that the company has lost capacity to build about 100,000 cars, and that's due to an ongoing chip shortage that has hit the automotive sector this year. Diaz's comments came a day after Volkswagen unveiled plans to build half a do dozen battery cell plants in Europe and expand infrastructure for charging electric vehicles globally, as well as accelerate efforts to overtake a Tesla. New chemistry and manufacturing processes will reduce battery cost by up to 50%. This will make e-cars even more affordable and as a result, even more attractive. Charging will be as easy as refueling. We are raising the number of fast charging points in Europe by five times over the next four years. Ladies and gentlemen, Volkswagen has proven to be robust and powerful in 2020. Global passenger car sales fell to 68 million units last year. In total, the Volkswagen Group delivered around 15% fewer cars than in 2019. Well, that's all for now on Africa Live Biz. But coming up on Global Business Africa, Nigeria records inflation at 7.33% in February. That, of course, is the highest rate for the last four years. We'll be looking at what's driving this as well as other stories. All that coming up top of the hour for now. Back to you, Richard. Thank you so much, Uche. Well, here's an inspirational story that you don't want to miss. Hey, South African artist Sanela Sitole, also known as Sun L Musician, is making international waves with his international music, his unique Afro Beat sound is a fusion of electronic music with R&B and soul. The musician has found a creative way to keep his fans up to date with his new songs during the coronavirus pandemic. Well, we caught up with the creative talent in Johannesburg and Kenya, and he tells us his story. Let's take a look. What inspires me is it's just to find healing when, when you are going through just darkness. I think that's, that's exactly how I, I did my whole thing. Is it was just through healing because I was going through a lot of personal dark vibes. The music was just an escape for me. Hi, my name is Sano Musician. I'm a DJ, producer, singer, songwriter, a record label owner of L World Music. I come from a small town. It's called Rosetta, but then I grew up in in Moy River, which is uh, a town, which is like about five, uh, five kilometers away. I do hit the gym, um, play a little bit of soccer with the guys, just to keep my mental health just a little bit better, you know. Um, but all in all, if I'm able to make a good song, I'm good. It's gospel, 
uh, from my grandma, uh, it's quiet from my sister, it's American soul from my dad. So that actually influenced the whole thing. The bass is dance music. So I'm able to fuse gospel, R&B, soul, you name it, but it's, it's just a fusion of so many sounds into this whole thing of dance music. I want people to feel uplifted once you listen to the song. I want you to feel good if you're in a bad space. So that's the message, it's always just inspirational. <laughs> Whenever I'm creating, it's, it's nothing comes before anything. It's, it's only a matter of whatever, the, whatever is inspiring the moment at the time. If, uh, if especially, it, it works even better if the vocalist or the artist is able to play an instrument because we can build a song around the guitar or a piano or whatever you play. <laughs> creation of the famous uh, Agana Mali, you know, it's, um, it was such a tough time at that, at that particular moment. I related, I relate uh, I was, uh, to the message that Sam was trying to put across, you know, because I was broke as well. Yeah, it was a very rough, rough time. And it was so easy for me to take all that energy into a record or a song. <laughs> I remember the first time I had my first gig in Kenya. I couldn't believe it. I thought it was a scam because we've had those quite a lot, uh, quite a lot, you know. Um, but then when I got there, it was so amazing that the songs are not sung in any of the languages in Nairobi, but people were, I'd say, mumbling along. <laughs> It really changed my mind and actually it fulfilled my story because it, it is an African story to the world, you know. So that really was full circle. I love Sanel music because it's so, it, it touches your soul, you know. I feel like it has every essential meaning of everything African, you know, that, that lives within all of us. It unites us, even if we don't understand what he's saying. His music is so beautiful. I Sanel because like his music's so cultural and it's so ethnic and it's so like original to like you can tell to where he comes from. With the pandemic it, it, it totally switched up everything because I couldn't have people in the studio so everything was more virtual. So it had we had to think of ways of just how can we sh do a show, a Sanel show of just having so many vocalists into this whole thing. So that's how actually the virtual show was born. <laughs> The title of the album says it all um, uh, to, uh, to the world and beyond. It's, it's, it's the second chapter. First chapter was Africa to the world. That's when I was telling African stories to other African countries. Now that I got a chance to uh, uh, gig or do shows, so I got to make new friends and artists in different spaces and from some parts of Africa so now with this album I got to collaborate with them basically I'm telling an African story to the rest of the world now so with this album I have it's 26 collaborations um, 31 songs um, it's a little crazy but I, I'm quite happy because I got to feature just some of the people that I met along the journey of Africa to the world. And I actually like that because it kind of led me to write it to the world and beyond. And I'm going to live through it to the world and beyond to write my next chapter. Africa Live. Find your voice.
All right, welcome in. Let's talk a bit of sport here on Africa Live. The new president of the Confederation of African Football, Dr. Patrice Monsepe, has returned home after being elected CAF president last week in Morocco. The South African has outlined how he plans to tackle the obstacles facing African football as CGT and CS Duplessis reports. The Confederation of African Football has a new man at the helm and he has his work cut out to ensure the beleaguered organization rectifies the glaring issues facing the beautiful game on the continent, beginning with the lack of a broadcast deal for all inter-club and national competitions. The work has really begun. We know we are football people. We need results. We need to score goals. At the end of the 90 minutes, we need to win. We will win. We will succeed. The next few months will be crucial for the newly elected president, who is committed to turning CAF into a self-sustainable organization and will spend the next 9 to 12 weeks traveling to begin tackling the task at hand. But the long-term objective is clear from the 59-year-old. African football will indeed become better, will improve in all of the areas that we discussed. And the bottom line is it will indeed be globally competitive and it will indeed be self-sustaining. And we will do it because all of us believe in that, but also because all of us are optimistic and positive and believe in the capacity of ensuring that African football is not just as good as the best in the world, but succeeds and does become the best in the world. Dr. Patrice Mutsepe's successful campaign has been met with jubilation here at Klorko by the 2016 African champions, and they believe their former owner is the right man for the job. But the hard work and earnest really starts now, both for Mutsepe as CAF boss and for the men in yellow who are in the CAF Champions League looking to push on to the quarterfinals. The support that he gives to the team is unbelievable. Uh, but the character itself and the personality that he presents uh, makes you as an individual to want to fight for him because the humility that he presents at any given stage will always drive you. The Sundowns head coach, who continues to chase a second continental title, maintains that the club's loss is African football's game. I want to believe it is a blessing in disguise for African football to have an administrator that will add so much value and passion into the game of football at, at that level. And I, I have no doubt that African football will never be the same again. Although his physical presence will be missed around Mamalodi Sundowns, his contribution and support will continue to motivate the players and staff. His legacy is undeniable and lives on. However, his focus now shifts to a new football chapter where he is responsible for change on a continent brimming with potential and where the sky is indeed the limit. CS Duplessis, CGTN, Johannesburg. And Egyptian club Zamalek will host Tunisia.